Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome to our webinar this morning on making sense of area and perimeter. We're delighted to have uh, Mark Prendergast with us. Mark is a senior lecturer in education at UCC. And uh, Mark will go through the presentation with you. And at any time, you'd be delighted if you type in your questions or your comments or your ideas or resources into the questions box. And then at the end, we'll have time to look through that and call out what questions you have or what comments. So over to you, Mark. Thanks, Fergus. And uh, thanks for the opportunity of doing this webinar today. Um, so welcome, everyone. I can't see anyone, but I again, I know there's a few, a few of you there that have been regular participants at numeracy workshops down through the years. So it's great to have you here today. Um, today's session is about making sense of area and perimeter. Um, any of you who would have been at previous sessions would know that I'd like to try and make this as practical as possible and get you doing different tasks and questions. Obviously, that's made very difficult by the online setting. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk through different tasks. I might pause slightly at times just for you to be able to maybe dissect the question or make sense of it in your own head. So I'll mostly just talk through some various solutions. And as Fergus said, he'll be sharing the slides with you and um, you'll be able to go through them in more detail in your own time. So again, thanks to everyone for coming and I hope you've been enjoying the Maths Week activities so far this week. So um, just to get started, uh, area and perimeter, they would fall under the branch of mathematics known as geometry. And um, just kind of a, a fun fact that might trigger um, some, some, some of your students' interest or just grab their attention. Um, the word geometry comes from two Greek words, geo meaning earth and metri meaning measurement. So geometry is really measurement of the earth. So it's the branch of mathematics that deals with anything regarding measurement in terms of uh, volume, length of lines, uh, angles, and area and perimeter would fall in under that. So that's going to be our focus for today. Uh, we're going to focus on primarily around QQI, QQI levels two and three. Um, level two, it's really around describing the properties of common shapes, such as rectangles, squares, triangles, and so on. And QQI level three is directly what we're going to be addressing today. Calculate the area of a square, rectangle, triangle, and circle using the correct formula and giving the answer in correct form. Also in, in the QQI uh, specifications, there's an awful lot um, around promoting problem solving. And this was taken directly from the QQI uh, select and use appropriate familiar mathematical problem solving strategies to solve problems in familiar context. So hopefully we'll focus on that today. I have kind of three main aims of the session uh, to focus on understanding, do that through the use of open-ended tasks and encourage the use of problem solving. And these were nine different strategies that project, the project maths development team encouraged for the use of problem solving um, when, when you're faced with a problem. So uh, trial and improvement would be kind of a major one that we use today. Maybe do a quick sketch of a diagram, uh, act it out, maybe do a table, work backwards, try and simplify the problem. So uh, just to keep those strategies in mind as we go through the various problems. So first up, we're going to look at perimeter. And I suppose, uh, you know, even your students who mightn't have any background in maths or haven't done maths in a, in a long time will have heard the word perimeter in, in popular culture. So we've all heard set up a perimeter, seal the perimeter, um, you know, break the outer perimeter. But, but what does actually perimeter mean, and specifically in a maths term? So the perimeter is the distance around the outside of a flat base or flat, flat surface or a 2D shape. So it's literally the measurement around the outside of such a space. So for in this case, we have a triangle and we're literally measuring 90 meters plus 40 meters plus 70 meters. So our perimeter in this case would be 200 meters. Now, one of the issues that I kind of have often found about finding the perimeter is that we often over rely on the repetition of lower order tasks which on behalf of the students really require little understanding or thought. So like, uh, if I opened up a, a maths textbook on perimeter, 
I might get a load of these type of exercises where basically, you know, in the example beforehand, students will be, you know, shown that they literally have to add each side together to get the perimeter. Now that's fine, that's how you find the basic perimeter, but then just getting students to repeat that over and over um, is really just kind of a repetition of, of a procedure task, in which case they'll generally use their calculator and won't really think about what they're doing. So I think we can improve on the task selection and getting students to really understand what the perimeter is. So there, there's kind of different problems involving perimeter. Um, so for example, these two problems, in which there's certain information missing and um, students might first have to identify um, that information before they can add all the different sides or for example they need to recognize that the length of this is 15 meters so the length all the way across here must be 15 meters so if this is four meters then this would obviously have to be 11 meters so just you know trying to get students to engage more the task and, and to understand it more um, the real open-ended tasks might be something like this so i think uh, you know, this is a very simple task, but the understanding that, that goes with this task for students to complete it is, is huge and just gets away from those kind of repetitive uh, procedural driven tasks. So draw three rectangles with a perimeter of 20 units and to use whole numbers, whole numbers only. So firstly there, if we go back to QQI level one or level two, uh, in, in terms of, of this strand, it said, describe the properties of, of, of 2D shapes. So e even there, we're, hit, we're, we're hitting that. What, how can we describe um, what a rectangle is? So we need to draw three rectangles. Before we can even do that, we need to know what a rectangle is, what are its properties. It's a four-sided shape, uh, straight lines, all interior angles are 90, opposite sides and opposite angles are parallel. So even before we can engage in that task, we need to draw on our prior knowledge from QQI level two, and what is an actual rectangle? Once we know that, we need to know what the perimeter is. The perimeter is the measurement or the distance around the outside of a rectangle. Um, so once we know that information, then we can go about uh, drawing. And what I like about this open-ended task um, is that, like I, I've taught, uh, um, you know, at, in adult education settings for for uh, a number of years, and. Um, one thing I know you'd probably be all familiar with is the diverse range of abilities in the class. So um, having an open-ended task like this ensures that all students are challenged um, differently. So one student might, might just be able to draw one triangle, whereas another student might get all three. So four plus six, um, plus four plus six, that gives me my perimeter of 20 there. Two and eight, that would give me my perimeter of 20. Seven and three, a side of uh, one length, side seven, and the width three, that would give me a perimeter of 20. Uh, an extension task might be, what, what is the maximum number of rectangles with a perimeter of 20 using whole numbers only? Um, so, you know, if anyone got finished that task early, you have a little extension there. And perhaps a follow-on task to that, which is closely related, draw three polygons with a perimeter of 20. So, you know, um, again, it's that open in the task um, firstly, we need to we need to know what is a polygon. Um, uh, so a polygon is a flat-sided shape enclosed by by straight lines only, but there's no limits on the number of sides or, or the angles involved. Um, again, we need to know what the perimeter is. So diff different options here. Uh, you'll find your students will come up with lots of various options here. Again, there's uh, there's so many different. Um, ideas that they can come up with to, to complete this task and the question there might be you know like we asked in the last task what is the maximum number of rectangles you could draw with a perimeter of 20 what's the maximum number of polygons you could draw with a perimeter of 20 and really like you know through some discussion there they, they see that there's there's really an infinite number uh, of polygons that they could draw with, with such a perimeter uh, so i came across this website actually and again i, I have the the website included in a list of resources at the end of this presentation. Um, and it's a website, uh, Taylor DA01. Um, so the, 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 the address is there at the end. But basically, it, they, they include all lots of different topics in maths, and, and, and perimeter is one of those. And basically, they, they have worksheets 
of increasingly difficult exercises. So um, they start with kind of basic exercises and finish up with um, more difficult ones at the end. So again, when you're teaching adult education, um, you have that diverse range of abilities. Uh, an exercise sheet like this is, is really useful. You know, there was kind of that task of, uh, tasks at the start, which everybody can get involved with. And then to those students who might be finished or who might need a bit of extra challenge, there's ones at the end that will certainly challenge them. A lot of, uh, sorry, a lot of some of the problems or ideas I get for, for my teaching might, might come from um, following people on Twitter who, who um, are involved in maths and in teaching maths and in numeracy. And I came across this problem actually only about two weeks ago. And it noted that the perimeter of the rectangle is 26 centimeters. How long is the red line? So the perimeter of the rectangle in, in black is 26. So the distance all around the outside of that rectangle is 26. How long is the red line? So when I saw this first, I was kind of saying, God, how, how do we how do we tell that? So it took it took a little bit of engagement with it and thinking with it, but I kind of I then saw that okay, if we take all these all of these vertical line segments, or sorry, all of these horizontal line segments, all of these going straight across. If we take all of those and bring them down straight down we will have a full line segment going the length of the width of the, the rectangle. So if you take all those line segments and bring them direct, directly straight down, you'll have a horizontal length. Similarly, you take all of the vertical line segments, so going across here and here. If you take all of those and bring them across to the width, you'll have another full line segment. Okay, so that red line there gives me one length and one width of the rectangle. So we know that the full perimeter is 26. We now have the length, uh, we have the distance of one length and one width, which is half of rectangle. So the length of that red line has to be 13 centimeters. So I, I, I like that problem. It was just something slightly different Definitely not something you'd see in a textbook, but it, it gets the students engaged. It's, it's a nice little problem. Um, see logic around it and, and, and stimulate their interest. So moving on to area, well, what is area? An area may be thought of as an amount of flatness. So the perimeter is the distance around a flat surface. The area is um, the amount of that flat surface, the amount of space that it takes up on a 2D plane. So. I thought that diagram was just useful. The perimeter is around the outside and the area is, is a flat space in the middle that it takes up. Uh, before we even kind of go into any formulas around the area, area is length by weight, I, I thought it was nice to introduce kind of what area is using a resource called Tangram tiles. So these are a mass manipulative made up of different shapes. And you have one shape which is just, which is just a one unit square. So the square has an area of one unit. So this little square here makes up one unit. And then you have these other shapes which, which come along. I think there's seven shapes in total. Can you find the area of each of these other tiles given that this is one unit? So if this is one unit, the area of this, again, um, online here, you can, you, it's fairly visual, you can see it, but it would even be better like the Tangram tiles are an actual concrete resource that students can, you know, could place could place this shape or this triangle over the square and they, they'd see that this is exactly a half of the unit square. The area of this again is is one if that's a half then we have two halves which is one square unit. Again we have two halves which is one square unit and the area of this bigger triangle we have one full square unit and a half and a half so we have two square units. So again, just getting that message across that area is the amount of space that a flat surface takes up. So this rectangle, the blue rec the rectangle in blue is made up of tangram tiles. What is its area? So we have a bigger triangle here, which we know is two. We have another one of those big, bigger triangles, which again, we know is two. We have a smaller triangle, 
like the one here, which we know is one. And then we have two half units, two half square units. So the area of the full rectangle is six square units. We have another shape. Um, what is the area of this tangram shape? We have the smaller triangle, which we know is one square unit. Um, we have this parallelogram, which is made up of two half square units. So we know that's one. And we have the bigger triangle, which we know is two square units. So the area of this tangram shape is four square units. So again, before we kind of dive into the formal, um, what is the area of a, of a square, of a triangle, of a rectangle, and you know, getting into the, the different formula associated with that. I think it's a nice activity just to get students thinking about, you know, areas, the amount of space that it takes up, and um, that's a kind of a, just a really nice informal activity um, that you can do with hands-on manipulative. But again, even in an online setting like this, it's very visual, so students can see exactly what they're looking for. So I'm just going to move on now to the kind of maybe more formal aspects of an area of a rectangle and the different formula involved in those. Um, again, I know Fergus would have said this at the start. I know a couple of more have joined the webinar since then. If, if there's any comments or questions, feel free to type them into the chat at any time. Um, even suggestions about how you might introduce something or do something. And for, I can't see the chat, but Fergus will um, be sure to, to bring those comments to our attention. So uh, definitely feel free to, to offer any suggestions or questions at any point during the, the webinar. So if we're moving on looking at the area of, of a rectangle, what, what actually are we trying to find when we find the area of a rectangle? I think like everyone knows from, from their maths education, you know, we, we all kind of remember the formula areas length by width, but what are we actually what does that formula actually mean? What what does it actually represent? Um, so we know the formula, it's length by width, but what does it actually mean? So the area of a rectangle it really means how many square units it takes to cover its surface. So we have a rectangle here, basically how many square, its area is how many square units does it take to cover the surface. So if I, if I um, just um, divide that rectangle into all square units and count them up, I can see that I have um, one, two, three, four, five, all, all the way up as far as 20 square units there. So that is my area. That's in effect exactly what I found. And that's where the units come from. They're square units. So uh, it's imp important to stress, perimeter is just a basic measurement. It's just uh, a linear unit, um, either whether it's centimeters or meters or just basic units, um, whereas area is measured by finding how many square units it takes to cover a particular surface. So that's why its units are square units. Um, so a shortcut, and that's, where, that's what the formula length by weight is. It's, it's just a shortcut. Rather than having to divide every single figure we want to find the area of into square units every time, um, a shortcut is to multiply its length by the width because we know that if we count across the length here, we have one, two, three, four, five, and then the width we have one, two, sorry, one, two, three, four. Four by five will give me 20. So it's exactly the same. Rather than having to count from one to 20 every time and divide it up into square units, we can just multiply the length by the width to get the same thing. So it's literally a shortcut. Um, area is length by width is 20 square units. Um, I'm kind of always looking at different ways that to, to visual area, to visualize area for students. And I found Lego was a really useful way of doing that. So um, I'm, I'm sure there's Lego lying around in various houses. And uh, if, we, if we look here, we have a Lego unit. It's length or its weight is one and its length is four and there's if we count up the squares there one two three four so we have one by four that the, the area of this lego is four square units here we have a length of two and a width by two if we count those up we have four two by two is four here we have width two length four um two by four is eight again here we have six by eight so again it might it's just a very simple thing but it might help some of your students just to visualize exactly what's happening when you're finding the area of something problems involving area uh, many of the, the 
problems that we would have involving perimeter could then be transformed in, into and used the exact same problems for find the area. So these are two problems we found we used, we mentioned earlier when we were looking at the perimeter. And we, we can use these two exact problems for finding the area. So uh, different ways we might go about this. We might, okay, uh, for that first one there, we, we might separate it into three different um, three different figures. So we have one, the H figure, and we might divide that out using the red the red line segments and say, okay, we're going to find the area of A, then we're going to find the area of B, then we're going to find the area of C, and add those together. Similarly for this second one, um, we might divide up the polygon into two different um, rectangles. So we're going to have rectangle A and rectangle B. Um, that's actually a square. So rectangle A and B, which is four by four, and we're going to add those together. So that's one method you might look at. There's there's other ways of doing it. You, you could take this whole, um, uh, you could take, this is actually a square again, 12 um, by 12. You could take that whole square, find the area of the whole square, 12 by 12, which is 144 square units. Um, that, that would be your A, and then find the area of, of this rectangle here, B, and this square here, C, and subtract them from the whole area. Similarly, in the last one, you can make this a full rectangle, um, find the area of the full rectangle, which is 150 meters squared, and then find the area of this smaller rectangle and subtract them. So nice little basic problems, but, but getting them thinking a little bit more about um, what they're actually doing, rather than just saying length by weight, length by weight, length by weight which is kind of the repetition of calculator work as we know it. Um, other problems involving area, again, going back to those kind of open, open-ended problems, and um, some of you might have been aware there's there's a mathematician called Jo Bowler. Uh, she's a maths educator. She's actually from the UK, but she's based in Stanford University in, in the US at the moment. She does an awful lot on open-ended problems and open-ended tasks, and she has a website called Ucubed, Dot com. So it's U Y O U C U B E D U Cube dot com. And if you log on to that website, she has some great open-ended problems. And she talks about open-ended open -ended problems as being low flow or high ceiling. So what she means by that is um, basically uh, if you again if you have a range of students in your class, there's something in that problem that everybody can attend, but uh, can attend to, but there's also something in that problem that um, can challenge um, any student as well. So I, I came across this particular problem on a website called openmiddle.com. So it's a, it's a actually a very useful website um, for lots of different ranges and um, some really good open tasks. So this particular task is find the area for the rectangle, fill in the boxes with the numbers through, from one to nine. Here you're only allowed to use each digit and most once. So sorry, find the largest area. So you're looking for the largest area. So um, you can use the digits one through nine. So my first attempt there, I said, okay, I'm gonna start off, I'm putting 98 here um, as my as my weight and put nine, nine here as my length, or sorry, seven here as my length. So seven by 98 gives me an area of 686 square units. So I was pretty happy with that. Then I was wondering, is there any way I could get that um, a bit higher? Is there any way I can make that area larger? So I actually tried when the largest digit here uh, as my weight, put nine here, and then have an 87 as my length. And when I multiplied those together, I got an area of seven, eight, three square units. So look, it's a very, it's a very simple task, but even, even that open-endedness brings up a whole discussion about why am I getting a higher area when I have nine instead of seven um, as the multiplier. And it brings up that about um, place value and the, the value of, of certain digits. So another open in the task, again, comes from that website, openmiddle.com. Use the digits one to nine to fill in the gaps without repeating a digit so that the shape has an area as close to 50 square units as possible. So again, for, it's, it's, a, it's a nice problem looking back at the strategies for problem solving, you're looking at how could I, how could I even start to attempt this? And uh, there's different ways you could work backwards, you could work at 50 and see what digits you need to fit in to try and get as close to as possible. Or uh, you could do kind of a trial and improvement like, a, like I just kind of started. So 
uh, similar to, the, to a problem from two slides ago, we need to divide this up. In, so we have two rectangles. Okay, if I put seven here, six here, and two here and four here, I'm going to find that if, if this is six and this is four, then this length here would have to be two. So the area of the first rectangle is seven by two, which is 14. And the area of the second rectangle is six by two, which is, um, that should be, sorry, so, oh, sorry, four by two, which is eight. Um, so 14 and eight gives me my 22 square units. So some of the, some of the students in your class might, might get that and, and, and that's, that's actually great. They, they've, they've done everything right there. And they might necessarily be the, the area closest to 50, um, but they've, they've made a very good attempt. Others, they might be able to push on and say, okay, I, I, 22, I can do better than that. I can get closer to 50. So I'm going to put nine here and eight here, and maybe five and four here. So again, if, if that's eight and that's five, then this has to be three. So nine by three gives me 27. Five by four gives me 20. 27 plus 20 gives me 47 square units. So uh, that, that's very close to 50, so, so that might work. So we've kind of looked at perimeter and we've looked at area in, in isolation. Um, an awful lot of, of questions and tasks um, would have some link between area and perimeter. So we're just going to look at what that link is, if there is any link for the moment. And a nice way to kind of get students thinking about this, I find is I, I often give my students two A4 sheets. So they take, they, they're given two A4 sheets and they're asked to find the area and perimeter of those sheets. So I just, um, they'd have to measure them. Um, so if you take an A4 sheet, it's, it's approximately 21 centimeters um, wide and 30 centimeters long. So again, if we find the area of that, it's 30 by 21, we get 630 square centimeters. So the area of each of these A4 sheets is 630 and then the perimeter would be obviously measure the distance around the outside um, will give me 102 um, centimeters. So we have two A4 sheets that are exactly identical with an area of 630 and a perimeter of 102. Now, I, I'd ask students then to divide each sheet in half. So I've given them two sheets. I want to, them to divide each sheet, sheet in half. I want them to divide the first sheet vertically and the second sheet horizontally. So the first sheet vertically and the second sheet horizontally and fold them over onto each other. So you'll have two figures looking like this. So um, the first figure now will still have a length of 30, but now this time just a weight of 10.5 and the second figure will have a length of 15 and still have a weight of 21. So if I was to find the area of each of these, the area of the first figure um, is 315 centimeters squared. The area of the second figure is also 315 centimeters squared. So we, we'd expect that. We the, Remember the area of the full A4 sheet was 630 and we folded that in half. So we've halved the area. So I now get an area of 315 for each, for each figure. However, if I ask them to find a perimeter, you can see that the perimeter of the first figure is 81. Um, by measuring around the distance around the outside and the perimeter of the second figure is 72. So the big learning there is that what that example has shown is that area and perimeter, they're very different measurements. Um, so perimeter is a measurement of a distance, area is, is measurement in square units. So they're different measurements, they're not generally connected. So just like that last example we've shown, areas, sorry, rectangles with the same area. So those two rectangles both had an area of 315 square centimeters, but they had different perimeters. Similarly, rectangles can have the same perimeter, but have a different area. So if we go back to one of the examples we showed at the start, um, these, are, these are two examples of rectangles with a perimeter of 20. So four plus six plus four plus six gives me 20. And, 8 plus 8 plus 2, or sorry, 2 plus 8 plus 2 plus 8 gives me 20. So each of those rectangles have the same perimeter, but their areas are different. So 4 by 6, this area is 24 square units. Um, 2 by 8, this area is 16 square units. And similarly, these are another two rectangles where you can see clearly that their areas are different, but their perimeters are actually the same. 
So um, that task with the A4 sheets is just a nice little link to show that, yes, air and perimeter are, are often included in, in the same questions and in the same tasks, but they are different measurements. And rectangles can have the same area with different perimeter. They can also have the same perimeter or different area. So to go through a couple of problems involving area and perimeter, um, this is a, a, a kind of a nice one to start off on. Um, the length of a rectangle is six centimeters and its perimeter is 16 centimeters. What is the area of the rectangle in square centimeters? So um, just again, going back to our problem solving strategies, if we give this to a student, what, what might help them actually get started in this problem and solving it? Oftentimes, just a quick sketch of the figure is really helpful. So we're told we're given a rectangle with a length of six, and we're told that the distance all the way along the outside is 16, what's the area? Again, going back to QQI level two, um, what's, what's been asked is to describe the basic properties. So we're told the length of a rectangle is six. So if I know the properties of a rectangle, opposite sides are equal in length. So if that's six, this side also has to be six. So now I have two lengths, six plus six gives me 12 centimeters. I know that um, the perimeter is 16 centimeters. So I have four centimeters left, which have to make up um, both of these widths. They both have to be the same. So four divided by two means that width has to be two centimeters. So now my area is just length by width, um, 12 square units, in this case, centimeters squared. Another open-ended task involving area and perimeter is this. Using the digits one to nine, fill in the blanks to make, to make it so that the value for the area of the rectangle is greater than the value for the perimeter. And then find the greatest difference you can uh, find between the two and the least difference you can find. So just to get started again, students would probably go down a kind of a, a trial and error route. Um, they want to try and find uh, fill in the blanks so that the area is greater than the perimeter. So the first two unit, two um, digits I might put in are three and two. So if I put in three here for my, my length and two for my width, um, I know that my area is three by two, it's six square units. My perimeter is three plus three is six, um, plus two plus two is four. So that would give me my perimeter of 10. So in this case, um, I am not kind of answering the task. The value for my area isn't greater than the value of my perimeter. So those, those digits don't work. So we know that three and two don't work. So we go back to the draw board. But what about nine and eight? Okay, in this case, with nine and eight, my area would be 72 square units and my perimeter is 34 square units. And we're kind of answering the second part of the question here. What's the greatest difference you can find? So the difference here, would be 38 between the area and the perimeter. What might be the least difference you could find? If I put a five as my length and a four as my width, uh, I can see that my area is still greater than my perimeter, which the question asks, and the difference is only two. So just, again, rather than giving the students lots of different questions involving the repetition of just finding the perimeter by adding all, around, all the way around the outside and finding the area by length by width, these kind of open-ended tasks um, just encourage a little bit more problem solving and logic and understanding of what they're actually being required to do. Another one of those open-ended tasks is how many possible perimeters using whole numbers only can you find for a rectangle with an area of 24 square units? So how many possible perimeters, again using whole numbers only, um, can you find for a rectangle of 24? So again a nice Kind of a, an option here would be to draw draw a rectangle, okay, and try and come up with okay if if the if the area if the area is twenty four, then I might have a, a weight of three and a length of eight, so three by eight gives me twenty four. So that's one particular option. Um, how many possible perimeters? It might be a good idea. Uh, that gives me if I add all those lengths and widths, that gives me a perimeter of twenty two. And if I draw up a table. Okay, uh, here is the one I found, three and eight, um, gives me my area of 24, my perimeter of 22. To find how many possible perimeters there are, uh, a table might be very useful. Um, and you can see what you're actually doing is, you're trying to get the factors of 24. So one by 24 gives me 24, 
2 by 12 gives me 24. Obviously, 3 by 8 we've done already, and 4 by 6 gives me 24. Um, and then these are these are all the various parameters. So you're linking you're you're linking back to a, a part of maths that you already would have done with students again back to factorizing. And that that's actually how you're actually solving that problem. Um, I'm just gonna I can see time slipping away. I'm gonna just talk for another few minutes, finish off these problems, and then I'll go back to Fergus and see do you want to do some questions or do you want me to keep going <coughs> through through some more material. So this is just a kind of a. a Problem involving kind of a real life um, idea that you have 41 meter sections of fencing. What's the largest rectangular area you could fence off? So, a quick sketch, uh, and you're trying to, again, it's kind of trial and error. You have 40 meters to go around, and you want to try to find the, fight, the largest area. So, if I have a perimeter of with one length nine and my width is 11, nine, 11, that will give me an area of 99 square units. So, that's my largest. And again, this is just a kind of an extension. Now imagine if you could build your fence up against the wall and you're only using three sides, uh, that changes the question again. It's a nice little extension. And that task, come, that task comes from the website Enrich Maths. Uh, for the second task, uh, you, you don't have to use um, the second length. So in this case, just 13 by 14 uh, gives you a much larger area of 182 square units. Um, so this is the last problem involving area and perimeter. It's a challenging problem. Uh, again, I actually saw it on Twitter during the week. It's from the website um, Brilliant, which has some really good resources. Um, it involves algebra, so you know, QQI, maybe the latter end of QQI level three, but definitely QQI level four. Um, you don't have to use algebra to solve it, as I'll, show, as I'll also demonstrate in a minute, but it, it was a really nice problem to really get thinking about what's actually happening and trying to find what, what area is. So basically, um, the figure, this figure here has an area of 48 square units. And you can see that this length and this length are equal. And they're also equal to this length and this length. And then this length here is five. It's also, this is also five here. And you're trying to find the length of of one of the sides of the square. So that's denoted in the question by x. So either this length or this length. So there's two ways of going about it. It's just I'm going to talk through one way. I'm going to label um, these smaller lengths, which we know are all equal. I'm going to label those as a. So uh, this small length here is a, this length here is a, a, and a. Now we know that the area of the yellow rectangle is 48 square units. So um, in area, we multiply the length by the width. So we know that the width is a plus a, which is 2a, and the length is a plus 5. So if I multiply 2a by a plus 5, that should give me 48. So 2a, which is comes from here, the a plus a, by the a plus 5, this length gives me 48. So if I work that out, multiply out my brackets, 2a squared plus 10a gives me 48. Um, now I have a quadratic equation, um, a squared plus 5a minus 24, which I solve. My factors are a equals minus 8, which can't be possible, and a equals plus 3. So a is going to be plus 3. So a there is 3, 5, and 3. So therefore, the length of one of the lengths is 5 plus 3 plus 3, which is 11. So that's kind of a, a way of looking, doing it algebraically. Another way of doing it, um, might be kind of more visually. Um, we know that the area of the yellow is 48 square units. Um, we know that the area that I've put here in red is 5 by 5, which is 25 square units. Now, the remaining, we, we have two smaller rectangles here um, uh, in, in that 48. So in this, in this larger rectangle, which has an area of 48, we have two kind of smaller rectangles, which are the same size rectangles as here and here. And we also have two squares, which are the same squares as here and here. So in effect, that area of that yellow rectangle is the same as the area I've outlined there in blue. So the blue area is also 48. So the area of the whole square is 121 square units. So to find the area of one length there, we just get the square root of that, which will give me 11 units. So we, each, obviously this way is a, 
I kind of prefer it. It's more, it's much more visual, um, but it also it's a different way of looking at it. Um, Fergus, do you, uh, is there any questions coming in on the chat, or do you do you want me to stop there and have fifteen minutes of questions, or would I keep going with the content? Hi, Mark. Um, my feeling is to keep going. Maybe I'll just ask everyone who's listening. So, if you want. Um, Mark, keep going for another 15 minutes. Just write the word continue in the chat box. And if you want Q&A, just write questions or Q for questions. So either write continue. They're all writing. Mark, please keep going, continue. Yeah. So maybe um, at a minute or two to 12, they might have a few comments. I could call those out. I might, we might come back here and then. Brilliant. Thanks, Fergus. Yeah, yeah you let me know if I'm off so j just um, the last thing I'm going to focus on the, in the with the not the last thing in terms of area in total, but in terms of one of the applications of area. Again, you know we have Pythagoras here, which is we all know a formula a squared plus b squared equals c squared. But what does that actually mean? What is what does that formula a squared plus b squared plus c squared, which is so useful in the maths? What does that actually mean? What you know? How do how can we make sense of that? So. That formula means that if we take a right angle triangle, the square on the hypotenuse, which is the longest length, so if we put a square in the hypotenuse, it's equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides. So just to try and visualize that, we have a, a, a right angle triangle with sides A, B, and C. If we put a square on side A here, um, we can see that that square is nine units squared. If we put a a square on side B, okay, and get the area of that. We can see that that area is 16 units squared. And the Pythagoras theorem tells us that these two squares added together should be equal to the sum, uh, their sum should be equal to the square on the hypotenuse. So if we put a square on the hypotenuse um, and we add up all those square units, we get, gives us 25. So you can see that in a right angle triangle, um, the square in the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square on the other two sides. And that's effectively all that formula is saying c squared is equal to a squared plus b squared. So just it was a nice application of how you can see area uh, in, in, in use. And, and that's a kind of a question involving that, the perfect dab. Um, again, it's just something that might grab your own students' attention or get them interested. Um, basically, you can see Paul Pogba, Paul Pogba here um, doing a dab, and there's a triangle here and a triangle here. It's only a perfect dab if each of those triangles are right angle triangles. So how do we find out whether they're right angle triangles? We can use that. If they are right angle triangles, we know that we can find that out using Pythagoras theorem, that 90 squared should be equal to 72 squared plus 54 squared, and 42 squared should be equal to 18 squared plus 37 squared after right angle triangles. So just to, to move on slightly from, from rectangles and, and squares, um, I'm just going to talk very briefly about um, parallelograms, triangles, and circles. So area of parallelogram, although it's not mentioned specifically in QQI level three, it's useful to know because all this knowledge builds, builds on, on one another. So basically a parallelogram, if you can see by the visual here, it's an out of shape rectangle or square. So that's all, that's all a parallelogram is. It's a rectangular square pushed out of shape. So if we take um, this section, if we, if we imagine we cut this section um, of a parallelogram, cut out this triangle and bring it over here, we now have a perfect rectangle. Um, so that's all we've done there. We've taken that section of the parallelogram and brought over here to form a rectangle. Now, in last week's class, if you're building this constantly with the students, in last week's class, we knew, we found out how to find the area of a rectangle. It's the length by the width. In this case, it's my base, my parallelogram, by my perpendicular height. So the area of the parallelogram can be found by multiplying the base and the perpendicular height, um, which gives us our formula, which is in our log tables, A by um, area is equal to base by perpendicular height. Moving on to the area of a triangle, a triangle is half of a parallelogram. So there's my triangle, there's a parallelogram. If I half the parallelogram, I get my triangle. And that's where my formula um, for a triangle comes from in my log tables. Half the base 
um, by the perpendicular height. So the formula for the area of a par parallelogram is base by perpendicular height. Formula for the area of a triangle is half of that, which is half base by perpendicular height. So again, you're constantly building on the content and should be all making sense to students. Just moving on to area of a circle, and before we can even talk to find the area of a circle, um, which is pi r squared, um, we might we probably come across the circumference of a circle, which is 2 pi r. So circumference um, is the exact same as perimeter, it's the distance around the outside of a circle, of a, of a flat circle in this case. So the big question here is what is pi? Pi is involved in the formula both for my circumference of a circle and and the formula for my area of a circle. So what is pi? And you know, I, I would be teaching maths with undergraduate students in UCC and there's still kind of difficulties around pi and what is pi and how can it be applied. So you know uh, in, in essence pi is the 16th letter of the Greek alphabet. That's where the symbol comes from. Um, and in mathematical terms it's a constant uh, 3.14159 and it's an irrational number. It's one of the most fa famous irrational numbers, which means that, um, that that's a never ending reoccurring decimal. So 3.1459, that's only the first five decimal places. That's go that goes on and on. So in effect, um, what pi is, pi is a ratio. It's a, it's a constant, it's a ratio um, of the circumference of any circle to the diameter. So, you know, in plain English, if you take the diameter of any circle. So you take the diameter and you place it around the outside of that circle. The diameter will fit around the outside of that circle exactly 3.14 times. So take the diameter, place it around the outside of the circle. The diameter will go around the circle 3.14 times. So a nice kind of uh, visual that kind of shows that is just this gif here. So it's rolling out the circumference and you can see that that circumference rolls out exactly 3.14 times the diameter of the circle. So again, I just felt it's a really nice visual to show exactly um, where the 3.149 comes from. So getting back to the formula for the circumference of a circle, we, we know that the circumference is the diameter multiplied by 3.14, um, which the diameter is really twice the radius, and uh, 3.14 is pi, so the circumference is just um, basically 2 pi r. That, that's, you know, we, we would have known in our log tables for years circumference is 2 pi r, but it's, it's actually, when you look at where that formula came from, it, it really does make sense, um, and it can be broken down very easily. So that's the circumference. There's there's an open problem there about perimeter and circumference again from that open open middle uh, website. I'm not going to go through it now because we're a little short on time. But you will have the slides um, when Fergus sends them on, and you can spend some time on them. Um, but I want to just get on to the area of a circle. Um, so we 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 now understand where the circumference formula formula comes from. I just want to try and make sense. Uh, see if we make sense where the area of a circle formula comes from. So I'm just getting out of my slides for a moment. And I'm going to go into GeoGebra. This is an app um, that was, was developed um, and shared by, by teachers. If you go into GeoGebra, um, the, the, the link for the app is in my slides anyway, but teachers around the world create different apps and they share them, which, which uh, you can then use in your own classes. So I'm going to use this app to try and show how to find the area of a circle. So I have a circle with radius r. I'm going to firstly straighten out the circumference of that circle. So just like I was doing in that GIF, I'm going to take the circumference of that circle and just roll it out. Okay, so roll it all the way out. Now we know the formula for circumference. We would have done it last week in class. The formula for circumference is 2 pi r. We know where that formula comes from. So now I'm going to take my circle and I'm going to dissect it into as many or as little parts. So um, kind of the more parts you dissect it into, the kind of more accurate you can see. So let's just say 80 or 90, 90 parts in this case. So I've, dissect, I've dissected my circle into 90 parts. Now I'm going to rearrange my circle by just rolling it out along my circumference. So I'm just very slowly going to roll it out. And we know when we roll it all the way out, it should be, it should be the length of my circumference, which is 2 pi r. 
So perfect. Now I'm going to fold the circle back on top of itself again. So fold it back on top of itself. And now we have a figure which is either a parallelogram or the more the more parts you dissect it into is a rec in, in a rectangular shape. So two weeks ago we, we looked at how to find the area of a rectangle which is length by width. In this case my, my width is r which is the radius. My length is a half times the full circumference. So my full circumference is 2 pi r a half of that, so 2 pi r divided by 2 is just pi r. So the length from here to here is just pi r. Um, and my, so my weight is r, my length is pi r, pi r by r is just pi r squared. So that's where the area of a, the formula for the area of a circle comes from. Again, you know, I would have learned in school, just learn off the formula by heart. I, I knew pi r squared, but I didn't actually know where it came from. But when I saw that, it just made total sense that it just, you know you could you could understand that a little bit more. So oftentimes, if I was teaching this in class, I would bring in a kind of a concrete resource like um, like the the I can't, I can't even think of. I have them up in the fridge. My, my daughter loves them, but basically the, the cheese circles. Um, so if you take a packet of cheese circles. Um, and I want to find the area, what's the area of this circle? You know, uh, an easy way to try and find the area might be to rearrange those circles into, in this case, uh, a parallelogram. We learned already how to find the area of a parallelogram, the base by the perpendicular height, and then that will give you the area of a circle. So the closing challenge then um, was just a, a really nice challenge here. What option provides more pizza? Would it be um, three, uh, three seven inch pizzas? two nine-inch pizzas or one 16-inch pizza. So it's a nice challenge just to get um, some discussion going in the class. Maybe have a kind of a, a poll of who would pick it three seven inches, who would pick one by 16-inch, and then get the students to work out um, using their knowledge of area what, what, you know, what pizza provides exactly um, the, the most. So um, if you take, took option a, a, which is three by seven inches, You'd um, those three pizzas together together give you 115 square units. If you took option B, which is two nine inches pizzas, that option it's it's similar, slightly larger than option one, gives you 127 inch pizzas. And option three, um, which you know I've done a poll in a class, and very few actually would pick the one full pizza. They they often pick the the two the two nine inch pizzas. Um, uh, because they often associate two by nine gives me 18 or they might even say three by seven gives me 21 but um, remember the formula is pi r squared so my radius which in this case is eight is getting squared so my 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 area for option three is 200 square units a uh, kind of a follow-on for that then might be you know um, in if, you know look up a look up a local pizza um, and what would be the price where, where are you getting the greatest, the greatest value? If you bought three seven inches or two nine inches or one 16 inches, uh, what, what, where are you getting the greatest value there? So just um, to finish up, which is perfect, I'm just coming up to 12, um, just from some user websites. Again, a lot of those open-ended tasks I got from this website here, openmiddle.com. That, that task um, involving the small bit of algebra was from brilliant.org, which was great. That worksheet that had the increasingly difficult questions or exercises came from this website here, Taylor DA01. And then obviously Enrich Maths, a lot of you would be familiar with that already. Some excellent resources there, um, which uh, across a wide range of abilities. So thank you very much for attending today and for, for listening. Um, I hope you picked up one or two, uh, you know, either tips are basically you know what i always say is when you're coming to kind of kind of workshops like this, work, workshops like this if you can take away one or two things that you can adapt and maybe try out with your own class um that would be great so hopefully you have picked up one or two things that you might say okay i might try that with my with my group next week or when i see them again um so just going to leave you on that um it's kind of one of my uh Aims in life is to be able to get a bill worth 26.86 euro 
uh, or 26 euro 86 cent i'm able to put down a, a pie in my tip but um that's a, a small maths joke for for us <laughs> uh, so fergus thank you we leave, we'll, we'll, we'll end on that um, lame joke note um and Mark, I'm thank you, any, any that, questions. Was, that was really great a really practical and i learned a lot and thanks a million that was great hopefully the tutors got plenty of tips plenty of tips for using in the classroom um and ideas on those websites at the end as well so because we've come to 12 o'clock we just wrap it up i'll just read out one or two uh quick comments so pat holwin has a tip here he says the grid lines feature on microsoft word is very useful for displaying area of 2d shapes in square units so that's, that's actually really, yeah that's, that's, that's a really good tip um and that, and that would make it you know that's excellent for find the area of, of different lots of different shape polygons being able to use those grid lines and show exactly what the area is it's finding the space and finding how many square units are in that space okay thanks so just to repeat that from pat the grid line feature on microsoft word it's very useful for displaying area of 2d shapes in square units thanks pat uh dominica galinska dominica she's asking uh, could you repeat where the rest of this week's webinars are okay so the rest of this week's webinars are on the nala ireland youtube channel so nala in ala nala ireland youtube channel and when you click on the nala ireland youtube channel click on videos and all this week's maths ones are they're either in the top line or the second line because each webinar the most recent ones are at the top so they're all the four of them are there uh, i'll have marked one up by monday for sure uh warren mcintyre saying uh some great open-ended questions there can the slides be made available yes warren um i'll send mark's presentation to everybody on monday so everyone who's registered will get it and i'll send also a recording to of this webinar okay um there's an o'reilly mark saying excellent session mark thanks a million so Thank thanks una Pat Holman is saying, great presentation, Mark, especially like to focus on open problems and working on properties of 2D shapes before working on formulas. Thanks, Pat. Uh, John O'Sullivan said, thanks so much, lads. That was a great presentation and some great tips. Uh, Heron is saying, thank you very much, Mark and Fergus. It was an excellent and really well explained. So thanks, Mark. Uh, Dominica said, brilliant, thanks. And Geraldine says, Thanks, Mark. Really useful and really practical examples. So thanks everyone for tuning in and for your comments and your advice there and your resources and your ideas. And a big thank you to Mark Prendergast from UCC. Uh, it was an excellent presentation and Mark always goes down well with the adult literacy or adult numeracy tutors and vocational training tutors, etc. So thanks, Mark. Uh, Bye, Bernalli, and for all this webinar now, and enjoy your weekend. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.